On Sunday morning, Japan's Hayabusa 2 space probe dropped a capsule from space, delivering an asteroid sample to Earth. The capsule containing several grams of rock, dust, and debris streaked through the atmosphere at high speeds before deploying a parachute and landing in Australia. The Hayabusa 2 spacecraft, launched by JAXA on 3 December 2014, is a successor to Japan's original Hayabusa craft, which returned with the first ever samples from an asteroid in 2010. After four years of journey through space, on 27 June 2018, it arrived at the 920 meters wide asteroid Ryugu. Ryugu, being a carbonaceous near-Earth asteroid, is thought to preserve the most pristine, untainted materials in the solar system. The spacecraft spent 18 months circling the asteroid, making remote observations. It also released four small robots onto Ryugu to collect data, images, and ultimately scout its craggy face for potential sampling sites. Due to the minimal gravity of the asteroid, all four rovers were designed to move around by short hops instead of using normal wheels. In February 2019, after identifying a safe spot for a pinpoint landing, the spacecraft descended towards the asteroid for surface sample collection. When the sampler horn attached to the spacecraft's underside touched the surface, a 5 grams tantalum projectile was fired at 300 meters per second into the surface. The resulting ejected materials were collected by a catcher at the top of the sampling device. Then, in July 2019, the spacecraft went back for subsurface sample collection. This time, it collected the first ever subsurface sample from an asteroid, extracting material from an artificial crater made by firing a copper projectile into Ryugu's surface. The spacecraft collected and stored the samples in thermally insulated sealed containers inside the sample return capsule. At the end of the science phase in November 2019, Hayabusa 2 used its ion engines for changing orbit and returned to Earth. On December 5, 2020, the spacecraft flew past Earth and released the sample return capsule. The capsule re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at 12 km per second and deployed a radar reflective parachute at an altitude of about 10 km. The sample capsule then landed at the Wimera test range in Australia. The JAXA personnel recovered the capsule and carefully transferred it into a box for safekeeping. The capsule was then flown to Japan, where it will be transported to a JAXA research facility for further analysis. The samples will shed light on how the solar system was formed and how water was brought to Earth. Hayabusa 2 spacecraft is now on its way to explore two more asteroids as a part of its extended mission. SpaceX launched their 21st cargo resupply flight to the International Space Station on December 6, marking the first flight of Cargo Dragon 2, the company's new and upgraded uncrewed cargo spacecraft. Unlike the first Dragon design, which uses a deployable solar panel, the upgraded design uses a trunk half covered in solar panels to provide power to the spacecraft. The spacecraft also features a much smoother and cleaner exterior capsule design and a different docking mechanism. The Falcon 9 rocket blasted off from Launch Pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, marking the company's 21st cargo mission for NASA and its 24th launch of the year. It was also a milestone 100th successful launch of a Falcon 9 rocket. Approximately nine minutes later, the booster's first stage returned to Earth, landing on one of SpaceX's drone ships in the Atlantic Ocean in a smooth touchdown. Packed away in Dragon's unpressurized trunk, along with other scientific payloads, is a new commercially developed airlock, named Bishop, which is designed to deploy microsatellites from the space station. The airlock is the product of aerospace company Nanorax, which helps private customers get access to space. The metal airlock will attach to an available port on the outside of the space station. Astronauts can store items in the airlock by opening up the port's hatch. When payloads are mounted inside Bishop, astronauts will close the port's hatch and suck the air out of the airlock through a pump. Then, a robotic arm grabs Bishop from the outside and remove it from the port, exposing the items inside to the vacuum of space. 26 hours after liftoff, the Dragon capsule autonomously docked with the orbiting laboratory on December 7. SpaceX's Dragon CRS-21 mission is the first supply ship to dock with the International Space Station without the help of astronauts. Typically, astronauts inside the space station use the station's Canadarm robotic arm to grapple incoming cargo vessels and manually attach them to the station. 
The arrival of the upgraded Dragon cargo spacecraft also marks the first time that two SpaceX Dragons have been docked with the International Space Station. NASA has announced the names of 18 astronauts who will travel to the moon under the agency's Artemis program. Vice President Mike Pence introduced a cadre of nine women and nine men of the Artemis team Wednesday during the 8th National Space Council meeting at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It's now my honor to announce the names of the Artemis astronauts who will take us back to the moon and beyond. These astronauts come from a diverse range of backgrounds, expertise, and experience. The group includes the next man and first woman who will walk on the lunar surface in 2024. NASA has also published a voluminous report on Monday, outlining the scientific priorities for the Artemis III astronauts. In the 188-page report, NASA set seven scientific objectives for the Artemis III mission. One of the goals will be to bring back a total of 85 kilograms of lunar samples, both from the surface and subsurface. The astronauts will only have a maximum of six and a half days on the moon, and the report provides a resource for mission planners who will be developing their surface activities. This week, the Blue Origin-led national team, one of three teams tapped by NASA to develop lunar landers as part of the upcoming Artemis moon mission, tested its powerful BE-7 engine at Marshall Space Flight Center. According to a Blue Origin statement, the liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen engine roared to life for about 10 seconds. The test measured the ability to extract energy out of the hydrogen and oxygen-cooled combustor segments that power the engine's turbopumps. When it's fully loaded and ready to go, the engine will generate 40 kilonewtons of thrust. Developed privately over several years, the BE-7 is the latest high-performance engine in the Blue Origin family. The national team plans to use the engine on both the program's lunar lander element, as well as on its transfer element, which will ferry the astronauts and their lander into low lunar orbit. The high specific impulse, deep throttling, and restart capabilities of the BE-7 make it the ideal engine for large lunar payload transport and many other in-space applications. China has successfully launched two satellites to study some of the most energetic events in the universe from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center Thursday. The gravitational wave high-energy electromagnetic counterpart All-Sky Monitor, also known as GE-CAM, represents one of the first new all-sky devices that will monitor fast radio bursts, high-energy neutrinos, and magnetars. To study these events, each satellite weighing 160 kilograms will orbit on opposite sides of the Earth at an altitude of about 600 kilometers. The satellites feature a dome-shaped array of 25 gamma-ray detectors and eight charged particle detectors. They will search for cosmic events such as gamma-ray bursts happening in deep space. The merging of ultra-dense objects in deep space generates gamma rays, along with gravitational waves. Within a couple of minutes of detection of such gamma ray signals, the satellites will send out alerts to telescopes around the world for follow-up observations. The craft is set to begin operations as soon as it enters orbit. Now, let's discuss some of the significant Starship updates from the past week. The latest SpaceX Starship prototype, serial number 8, launched on an epic high-altitude test flight on December 9, taking off from SpaceX's facility near the South Texas. The flight took place after a last-second abort occurred on Tuesday, due to one or several of the rocket's three advanced Raptor engines aborted their ignition. Within 24 hours, SpaceX team fixed the issue and readied the prototype for its 12.5 km flight. Let's analyze what actually happened during the flight. Starship SN8 ignited its all three Raptor engines for the third time and lifted off from Launch Pad A on Wednesday evening. Raptor engine serial numbers 30, 36, and 42 throttled up and started pushing the vehicle upwards. The Raptor runs at around 78% liquid oxygen and 22% liquid methane. The frost on the outside of the Starship shows where the propellants are inside the tanks. The lower ring is where the liquid oxygen is located, and the larger ring above is where the liquid methane is stored. Before the flight, many assumed that the vehicle would turn off all three engines at once during flight and then keep coasting up to its apogee. But at about 100 seconds after liftoff, one of the three Raptor engines shut down and gimbals out of the way to allow the other two engines as much space as possible. The insulation inside the engine skirt catches on fire from the flame puff, but it quickly burned away. Another two minutes after that, one of the remaining Raptors also got shut down and gimbals out, 
leaving one engine active. That one engine continued to burn for another 90 seconds, producing just enough thrust to lift the vehicle to its apogee. The shutdown of engines one by one created asymmetric thrust, causing the vehicle to slowly turn sideways. Finally, at a bit less than five minutes after liftoff, before its shutdown, Raptor serial number 42 gave the Starship a gentle push needed to swing it to horizontal. Cold gas nitrogen thrusters, along with forward and aft fins, carefully controlled the Starship and brought it horizontal to begin the belly flop maneuver. The fins were actuated by electric motors, powered by Tesla batteries. Starship then spent around 90 seconds in freefall, controlling itself using four large flaps and shedding velocity through aerodynamic drag. At a height of about 200 meters, the Starship relights two of its engines, aft flaps fully retracted to reduce drag, and the engines gimbal to swing over the entire Starship to vertical. Things went wrong from here on. Raptor serial number 30 got shut down unintentionally, and the plume of the Raptor SN36 flashed an electric green, quite literally consuming its copper-rich internals in an unsuccessful attempt to slow down the vehicle. Traveling about 30 meters per second, Starship SN8 smashed into the ground. According to SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, Raptor performed great throughout the flight, with the bright green plume likely explained by extremely oxygen-rich combustion caused by low fuel header tank pressure. According to him, the test primarily focused on testing three-engine ascent, body flaps, transition from main to header tanks, and landing flip, which serial number 8 completed without any significant issues. During the flight test, SpaceX gathered loads of data that will allow them to build improved Starship iterations in the future. SpaceX's Starship test and launch facilities appear to be almost completely unharmed by the destruction, likely requiring only minor repairs and refurbishment.